So Agile Leadership in two hours, we will jump right into the topic because we don't have that much time. And I'll switch quickly to my presentation, sharing a few slides with you. Uh, just a second, making sure I have everything set up correctly. All right. So Agile Leadership in two hours, we will basically cover two topics. One topic is the concept for Agile Leadership. That's the very first one that we're going to cover. Those of you who have a bit more experience in the Agile space, there might be some redundancies, but I uh, always use a lot of case studies from organizations, which some of you probably haven't seen before. So I think that there will be some interesting points in there as well. Then the second piece is going to be actually what Agile leadership is all about. What does it mean? And we will use a specific model called the Leadership Agility Model from Bill Joyner and Stephen Josephs to make it basically make it more tangible. And we will do this in, an, in a way where, where you also uh, basically run an exercise, all right? Limit, given the limited time frame, we can't do it in the same way that we would do it in a workshop. We will still, we will still do it in a, in a shorter version. Now, the intention of this workshop is not to sell you uh, one of our Agile leadership classes. The intention is to create awareness for the topic and if you're then interested, also show you ways of how you can go on your personal Agile leadership journey. That might be reading some of the books that we recommend, that might be watching some of the videos that we recommend, that might be signing up for some of the classes that we run or other of our partners run. But that's up to you. I will definitely give you a lot of advice and recommendations on how to move on that journey, but I will spend the vast majority of the time in this session to actually create a connection between you and that topic so that you can decide for yourself whether you actually want to go on that, on that journey at all or not. So who am I? Uh, a few words about myself. My name is Saurabh Salimi. I'm the founder and CEO of Scrum Academy, which is a boutique consulting and training company based out of Cologne in Germany. We are a small organization, but we have a big global network of partners that we cooperate with, with whom we can also deliver towards larger organizations. I'm a certified Agile Leadership Educator and certified Scrum Trainer with the Scrum Alliance and also a strategizer coach with a strategizer with a company co-founded by Alexander Osterwalder. I was also a member of the Scrum Alliance Board of Directors for three years, so I know a bit of that perspective as well when it comes to selecting a CEO and controlling a CEO or, or basically judging them. Um, based on my background, I'm a medical doctor um, who then later joined Bain and Company, stayed there for almost three years, and ultimately ended up doing uh, the entrepreneurial journey. I have founded uh, five companies so far, um, more products than this. Some of them have succeeded, some of them have failed, and the latest iteration basically is our organization Scrum Academy, where I've been involved for more than six years, seven years now. And I spent the vast majority of my time training organizations in the topic of agility, be it leaders, be it product owners, be it scrum masters. And the rest of my time, I actually work with some organization, with selected organization on specific projects where we help them build products in a, in a way that they haven't done before. Uh, driving development cycles down from five years to 18 months or, um, or even shorter, in, depending on the product that we're working on. Uh, I have a family, three kids and a wife, uh, love sports, cooking, and reading. And my philosophy when it comes to teaching is usually pretty well described with this one quote from Socrates. I actually try to inspire more and make you think about things differently than to teach you specific topics. Because the things that I have seen in various organizations might not necessarily work for you, but I think they will definitely serve as an inspiration for you. So help you think about your environment differently, help you become better at the work that you're, the, that you're doing. So two topics to cover, the context for Agile leadership, as I mentioned earlier, and Agile leadership itself, we will dive right in. And we dive right in with a question for all of you. And I want you to take a few moments and think for it yourself, which organizations were you put up on a list that were the most commercially successful in the past decade. Take a few moments, think about it, ideally put it in our chat. Zoom, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> 
Netflix, Amazon, Apple, the ones that dare to disrupt, absolutely. SAP, not, not so sure about that one, but yeah, maybe Spotify, Apple, Facebook. So if I look at that list, the vast majority of these organizations we would consider as so-called tech companies. And with the exception of Spotify and maybe SAP in this case, all of them are based out of the US and I think all of them exclusively based out of the West Coast of the US. Now, there are a lot of organizations and all of them are correct, right? They have all been tremendously successful. But there are a lot of organizations that have also been very successful, but we don't consider, but we don't think about them when we think about organizational success. Because A, organizational success is more than just being successful on the stock market. Organizational success can also be due to sustainability and a lot of other things. And B, they're just not as hyped as many of these technology companies. And some of those companies, including the ones that you have already mentioned, I have put on this, uh, on this slide, and some of them are super interesting. Morningstar is a tomato processing organization. Super interesting, super successful in the business that they do. Hire, and we will talk a bit more extensively about Hire, is a company that builds, you could consider them tech, but it's not like really high tech because they build refrigerators, dishwashers, washing machines, all of those kind of things. Then we have Burtzorg, which is a healthcare service providing company, primarily based out of the Netherlands, Southwest as an airline, and Handelsbanken as a bank based out of Sweden or in general Scandinavia. Now, a lot of these organizations have several things in common, and we will dive deeper on those things. Now, but when you think about that, those companies that you mentioned, the ones that I mentioned, those that are so successful or that have been successful, over the past decade or even longer, what do you think was or is the reason for their success? Again, take a few moments, think about it, put it in our chat. <clears throat> mm -hmm. <clears throat> Change, quick times to market, strong focus on customers, innovation, yeah, I like that one. The ability to change, absolutely, right? So all of the things that you're mentioning are correct and probably even the ability to change refers back to the topic of innovation, right? Being able to change your products, for example, or your business models. All of that ultimately is an innovation to what kind of products you build or what kind of business models you design. And when we think about the topic of innovation, one of the companies that comes to mind very often is a company like Tesla. The interesting, there are several interesting pieces here, and let me just go through them fairly quickly. Number one, Tesla is not even 20 years old. The company was founded in 2003, and surprisingly, they were not the first ones to build electric vehicles. Actually, the two founders of Tesla, Mark Tarpening and Martin Eberhardt, wanted to buy an electric car for themselves. And when they wanted to do this, they saw that GM, who was basically leading the electric vehicle space at at that time, sorry, was calling back all the EV ones that they had built to destroy them because they didn't think there was a market opportunity. Still, Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpening believed this was something that was necessary to be done in order to deal with the climate crisis. So they founded Tesla and they were yeah, lucky enough to get someone like Elon Musk engaged initially as an investor, later as a chairman of the board, and later, I think, as the fourth CEO in the history of Tesla. In 2006, Elon Musk wrote a secret master plan on how they were going to execute. To this date, from my perspective, one of the best company visions laid out or product roadmaps laid out, which I highly recommend everyone to read. Now, as part of that plan, they actually highlighted how A, they were going to be very focused, one product or product category at a time, and B, how they were going to do this incrementally and iteratively. Those of you who are familiar with agile ways of working, incremental iterative probably rings a bell. They started out with assessing their most important assumptions. So one of the assumptions is, are people even going to buy an electric car? Another assumption is, can we even build an electric car that people are going to buy? 
And in order to do that, they ran so many experiments and they tried to run them as cheaply as possible. So those of you who are familiar with the lean startup methodology, et cetera, a lot of those things Tesla did really, really well, including leveraging existing technology. For example, the chassis of the Lotus Elise or the lithium ion batteries that were already being used in laptops, et cetera. All of those things they did well, assessed or validated one assumption after the other, and then went from the Roadstar to the Model S, to the Model X, to the Model 3, and now the Model Y. What Tesla also did was go beyond the traditional industry boundaries for car or automotive companies. So they didn't only build a car that was better in many cases or in many senses than existing cars, they thought about the overall business model. So they looked at, okay, we need to produce or build our own batteries because there's going to be a shortage of batteries in the world. They thought about the, inner, the business model in, in terms of how do we sell the products. So they started selling the cars online. To this date, nobody else does it, or at least they don't do it the way Tesla does it. Then they thought about the charging network. And a lot of those pieces, they are all things that are not necessarily part of what traditional automotive companies do. But Tesla, as a newcomer in that business, went way beyond the traditional industry boundaries. And with all the innovation and the pace of innovation that they were able to deliver, they managed to not only surpass Toyota, which you see on the right-hand side, this was from June, July last year, as the most valuable automotive company, but actually triple or quadruple their, their value uh, on the stock market uh, even after that, right? And today, and I think last time I checked was February 22nd, Tesla was still very, very high. Toyota has slightly, had slightly gone up from 182 billion to 230 billion. And that's the case for almost all the other car companies as well. So Tesla as a newcomer in that business, even if they're hyped, it's incredible what they have achieved. And if you look at that, the ramp up of their car deliveries, more or less on an exponential curve, but this might be a coincidence, might also be due to the nature of how they run their business. So one of my good friends, Alex Osterwalder, he has this phrase where he talks about business models being like yogurt in a fridge. Ultimately, all of them expire. And what all the companies that you mentioned do really well is they are constantly re-evaluating and reinventing their business models, which makes them so successful. One of the great examples here is Apple. Apple, much older company than Tesla. Sometimes we forget that it was founded in the 1970s many years before I was born at least. And this chart on the right-hand side that you see here demonstrate or shows us the percentage of revenue that is contributed to the, through the Mac. And at the beginning of this century in 2000, the Mac was still contributing around 86% of the overall Apple revenue. Due to the introduction of new products, the iPod, the iPhone, then later the iPad, the Apple Watch, the revenue contribution of the Mac went down from 86% to 10% only. And this is not based on Apple selling less Macs. We can actually see this on this next chart here. The number of Macs they sell went constantly up, piked in 2015, is still much higher, six times higher than it was at the beginning of this century, of, of, this, of two decades ago. And the prices of the Macs also have gone up. You probably know this as a consumer, but the revenue contribution of the Mac has gone down because Apple was able to identify or create so many new products and business models that significantly drove its company's revenues, making it the most valuable company on the planet. And Apple is a great example in another sense as well. If you look at the next chart here, you see in the yellow bars, the uh, number of iPods being sold. And at the beginning of like 2006, 2007, many iPods were sold. In 2007, the iPhone was introduced and the iPhone and later the iPad contributed to basically the iPod completely losing in terms of relevance, right? Apple barely, I don't know, if, I don't even know if they still manufacture, I think they do, but they barely sell any iPods. So Apple was willing to sacrifice their own holy cow, like get, get rid of that one cash cow because they disrupted themselves. 
Many organizations are not willing to do that. Some of the telco companies that I had the, the chance to work with had products similar to WhatsApp many years before WhatsApp existed, but they never launched it to market. Why? Because they were afraid to lose their SMS revenues. And guess what? Somebody else did it. The same happened to Kodak, where some of you might be familiar with, they actually invented the digital camera, but they didn't introduce it to market. Why? Because they were afraid of losing their revenue coming in through films. And surprise, they still lost that the revenue because somebody else did it. You can't postpone that. So this will happen in many, many organizations. Apple is one of them that is willing to change, to disrupt themselves. Yeah, uh, you, you worked in telecom, you used to block those apps. And how long did that work? That doesn't work, didn't work that long, right? So let's continue. Now looking at innovation, it's important to distinguish what types of innovation are out there. And there are many different ways to make a categorization. The one that I like best is from Gary Hamill, uh, outlined in his uh, book, The Future of Management. And he distinguishes four different types of innovation. The first type, is operational innovation. And by the way, I don't know if I mentioned it, you will all receive that slide deck if you want. So you don't have to take screenshots, et cetera. I will share that with you as a PDF document so you can recap everything that we, that we covered in today's session. Operational innovation is all about uh, like managing your current business model operationally better. So whatever we do in terms of lean initiatives, that's all operational innovation introducing CRM tools like Salesforce to be better in reaching our customers, operational innovation, ERP tools like SAP, operational innovation. All of those things, operational innovation, they have an impact, but not the highest impact when it comes to making your company invincible, as Alex likes to point it out. Next one is product innovation. So we talked earlier about Tesla. Now let's look at all the other major automotive companies. What are most of them doing? They are trying to compete with Tesla by creating new products. So Porsche building electric vehicles, Audi building electric vehicles, and so on and so forth. Product innovation is great. It already has higher impact if you do it well than operational innovation because it not only optimizes your current product and business model, it gives you a lifeline towards a new product, which is probably more state-of-the-art giving the technology that customers expect you to deliver, right? But it doesn't cut the deal completely because what you actually need is strategic innovation or Alex would put it business model innovation. And that's what, for example, Tesla did. So if you are now Audi or Porsche and you only build an electric vehicle without every other aspect of that business model, starting from the battery production, the autonomous driving, the supercharging network, guess what? Your product might find customers, but it's not going to be able to really compete with the offering of Tesla because they are looking at this much more holistically. So strategic innovation goes way beyond product innovation. It looks at an ecosystem and tries to create a lot of things around it. Sometimes you have to vertically integrate. Sometimes you have to horizontally integrate. Sometimes you have to close partnerships, right? You don't have to do everything yourself, but you have to think about your value proposition to customers much more holistically, much more strategically. But the highest impact, at least given what Gary Hamill shares with us, is none of the three, it's management innovation. Why? Because management innovation, the right structures, policies, matrices, and practices in your organization, which are all things that managers and leaders can influence and innovate on, all of those things create the foundation for all the other types of innovation to emerge in the first place. So if you really want to build organizations that change as fast as change itself, and are able to reinvent themselves over and over and over again, like some of the organizations we mentioned earlier, then thinking about management innovation is one of the biggest levers that, that you can actually address. And we will talk about what management innovation actually means. So Gary Hamill um, says, in, uh, right now, in most organizations, 
They are run based on 21st century internet enabled business processes. That's all the software as a services that we use and so on and so forth. But they still have mid 20th century management processes. For example, the management by objectives invented by Peter Drucker in the 60s and 70s of the previous century, all built atop of 19th century management principles. And what I mean by that, or what he means by that, I will dig deeper a bit later when we talk about the history of management as setting the context for a new type of management and leadership to emerge. Now, I mentioned we will talk about management innovation a bit deeper, and we will do this using the case study of hire. Hire, um, and the reason I use hire, there are multiple reasons for that. Number one, it's an older company. So it's not one of those 10, 15, 20 year old companies still founder led, started out completely being innovative, etc. cetera. It's, it's an older company, it's a legacy company. It's not even led by the founder. They have a CEO who is a hired manager, right? Who joined the company later in time. The second reason why I use hire is that hire is not one of those companies that's based out of Silicon Valley. Because too often, especially when I work with clients out of Germany, Switzerland, or other European countries, I always get these excuses. Yeah, but that works in Silicon Valley. It doesn't work for us. Yeah, but that works for software. It doesn't work for us. Yeah, but that works if the founder is still running the company, but it doesn't work for us. If you look at hire, they have all the same situation. They have the similar situation to most organizations here in continental Europe, et cetera, not founder led, not in the software space, not in Silicon Valley. And there are other things that we can take from this, but I will talk about them a bit later. So hire tremendously successful, despite being in a very boring and saturated market. If you think about dishwashers, refrigerators, and washing machines, still were able to significantly grow their business year over year, and also introduce completely new product lines which resulted in over $2 billion of market value from new ventures. Now, if you talk to the CEO of Hire, and if you read some of the case studies about them, um, one case study really well captured in Humanocracy, again, by Gary Hamill and Michele Zanini, all of that success is based on three pillars. Number one, turning every employee into an entrepreneur. And we will talk about how they did this. Number two, creating zero distance between employees and users. And number three, making the company a power node in an ever expanding web centric ecosystem. What does that mean? On the right hand side, you see a list of, I think, seven bullet points. And we start at the top. We will not go through all of them, but you have that presentation for yourself to, to go through them later. So one of the most important things they did, and this is where we talk about management innovation, they looked at the huge monolith of organizations that they have with around 80,000 employees and broke it down into thousands of micro enterprises, right? Small, not organizational units, but independent organizations that are all part of this web centric ecosystem, which is higher. As part of that, looking at the bullet point number three, they also went from internal monopolies to internal contracting. What does that mean? This is again, one example of management innovation. In most organizations, we have monopolies in several areas. Think about HR, it's a monopoly. Think about finance, it's a monopoly. Think about legal compliance, like all of those areas, all of those supporting functions or purchasing or procurement, they are basically monopolies in an organization. They set the rules for all the other organizational units on how they should create value for the customers. Might not be the right way or the best way to do it. So what does hire do? The moment they break up the huge monolith into many, many micro enterprises, this also means that maybe the 500 people that are in HR they are broken down into six, seven, eight, maybe 10 micro enterprises delivering HR services to all the other micro enterprises. This means that now the executives or the, in the, or the individual micro enterprises can choose with which HR or finance or legal or compliance micro enterprise they are going to make business with. And guess what? 
This means that those former monopolies now have to compete with each other. And we all know whenever you basically bust the monopoly and create competition, usually innovation thrives. And Hire takes it even further. They tell their micro enterprises, if one of our internal micro enterprises cannot give you the services that you need, or if you receive superior services outside of the web-centric ecosystem that we as an organization are, feel free to do so. Because that again, results in more innovation pressure for every single micro enterprise. So to look at a few other things, um, from employees to owners or entrepreneurs, every single member of those micro enterprises owns a share in that micro enterprise. So if the micro enterprise does well, this specific employee, that whole team does well, which results in more and more people really thinking like business owners because they are business owners, right? In many, especially European organizations, we underestimate the power of ownership and hire. And interestingly, a company out of China makes that happen, right? So these are just a few things about hire. Their CEO's goal is to let every employee become their own CEO. This doesn't mean that they leave hire and create their own company, but that they are in a position to take decisions like a CEO would on behalf of the organization because they have the competence, because they have the clarity, because they feel empowered to do that and because their incentives are aligned with the incentives of the, of the organization. All of the things that we talked about, none of them was in place when Zhang Rumin joined. All of those things were created and invented basically through experimentation over several decades. So this is not a 12 month McKinsey comes in, nothing against McKinsey project where suddenly the organization is completely changed. This is an internal driven process over many, many years, decades with experimentation and ultimately they got to where they are today. And guess what? They're still experimenting. It's not like they have identified best practices. They're continuously trying to become better as an organization. So one word of caution here, don't take hire as that one like organization to copy and try to make your organization the same way as hire. The same you shouldn't do with Spotify or any other organizational model. Each of those companies have found their own model and we can take inspiration from it. But I think the best thing is to see how they did it, which is continuously evolving based on a lot of experiments. Next question for all of you. What does it take to innovate? What needs to be in place for innovation to emerge? <clears throat> Courage, free minds, creativity, time, no fear of failure, space, <clears throat> transparency, a failing fast culture, safety, right? All of them are true. I think one of the best or most important things is the willingness to fail, not aiming to fail, right? But being willing to fail, right? Taking the risk of failure, not failing on purpose. Right? There's, there's a very important distinction between those two things. When we talk about a culture of failure, the aim is never to fail. The aim is always to succeed. But in order to succeed, you are okay with failing because you know, as Jeff Bezos says, that failure and invention are inseparable twins. And when he speaks about his company, Amazon, he says, this is the best place in the world to fail. And he says this very publicly. He writes this in his shareholder letters. Now, what other CEO would do this, right? To tell their shareholders, we are the best place in the world to fail. But this is also the foundation of the amazing innovation culture and Amazon, I'm not saying that everything about Amazon is amazing, right? But the innovation that they demonstrate is just truly mind blowing over the period of now more than two decades. We are all aware of the successes that they had, right? Be it Amazon One Click, be it Amazon Prime, be it the marketplace, be it later Amazon Web Services, which is a completely new business area, right? be it Amazon Echo, Amazon Alexa, I hope I didn't get any of the Alexa started, right? 
So all of those are great successes, but they also had significant failures. I just shared with you three of those examples. Number one, Amazon auctions. Many years ago, they wanted to compete with, with eBay, right? In the auction space. So they introduced their own Amazon auctions. It didn't work. After that, they tried something else. It didn't work either. And ultimately out of all of that learning and that failure, they created Amazon Marketplace where initially everyone told Jeff Bezos, are you crazy? You're going to give away your own platform so that other people can compete with you on your own platform. They still run it as an experiment and they saw it works. Today, more than 60% of Amazon retail's revenue comes through the marketplace. Amazing. Another one, Amazon Local, something similar to Airbnb today. They tried it many years ago, but didn't work. Nothing came out of it. So they are not in that space. Maybe at some point they do again something similar. But back then they tried it, didn't work. They shut it down, done. Last one, last example in terms of failure, the Amazon Fire Phone. Um, some of you might remember, most of you probably won't, a product they intended to build to compete with Apple and Android in the, in the, in the smartphone wars. I think they spent around $2 billion on this. It didn't go anywhere. Huge failure. There are presentations of Jeff Bezos talking about the Fire Phone. They're still on YouTube, but the product didn't go anywhere. But the same team that built the Fire Phone, Jeff Bezos told them when it failed, you have one day to be sad. Tomorrow I expect you back. We have another project for you. That same team built the Amazon Echo and Amazon Alexa. So again, a huge win, a huge success after initially failing at another product. Now, we looked at some numbers from experienced and like professional venture capitalists. And all of those venture capitalists ultimately aim to fund or identify a billion dollar startup, right? The, the so-called unicorns. What do you guess? How many startups, and Sumaya, you're not allowed to answer this one because you know the answer. How many startups would one have to fund in order to get to a billion dollar valuation? What do you guess? Think about it and just put your number in the chat. Steve, really three? If it's three, I will right now fund 30 of those startups to get to 10 billion value valuation within the next years. The number is much, much higher. Uh, 5,000 is a bit too high. I think then nobody would be in the venture capital game. The actual number is something around 200, 220. So when you look at the numbers from 2008 till 2010, around 1,100 startups were, were funded in, in Silicon Valley. Seven, 10 years later, uh, um, 330 still active, 55 valued over 100 million, and only five valued over 1 billion US dollars. So that's one out of 200, 220 companies. Now, how many organizations that you work in or work with are willing to have so many failures to get to a billion dollar product? And don't tell me that organizations are not aiming for it because all the pharma companies are aiming for billion dollar products. That's what they call a blockbuster drug. If they make a billion dollars or more in revenue on an annual basis, right? But to what extent are they willing to deal with the failure? Now, many pharma companies have learned this because they put 200, 500, 1,000 molecules basically into the race. And from one stage to the next stage in terms of like clinical trials, they become less and less and less. And hopefully, ultimately, there is one that makes a huge difference. Still, they don't know it's going to be a billion dollar drug. Why? Because A, they still need regulatory approval. B, they need to create the awareness in the market so that doctors prescribe it, and then ultimately it needs to result in superior patient outcomes, which you can experiment on early on, but ultimately you will know when it's out in the market, right? And if you go away from pharma companies, the vast majority of all organizations don't have a process in place where they are able to fund a lot of small initiatives. This doesn't mean that you need to increase your your innovation budget. Interestingly, some of the most innovative organizations don't have the highest innovation budgets. 
they are just incredibly good, not at selecting the ideas, but at assessing the ideas, validating the ideas quicker than anybody else does. And by that, killing ideas earlier and then doubling down on the ones where they see more potential, right? So, but risk acceptance, this is crucial when it comes to innovation. And Jeff Bezos mentioned it earlier, failure and invention are inseparable twins. Sorry, you can also put this another way. And I actually like that quote here from Oprah Winfrey. It is, I don't believe in failure. It is not failure if you enjoy the process. So if you as an organization set things up for innovation, if you create a culture where everyone knows failing is part of getting to the innovation, it's just part of the game, right? You can't compete in a basketball championship if you're only out there to win. Everybody will lose. Michael Jordan lost more than he won, right? So all of us, we lose and then we win. And depending on what we learn, we actually become better at what we do and increase our chances for winning. And that's what I think Oprah Winfrey means here. So it becomes part of your process so that you're able to deal with it much, much better. A great visual, and this is from two ladies on Twitter that I follow, Liz and Molly, I highly encourage you to follow them. We think of failure and success as opposites, when in reality, failure is part of success. So keep this in mind, and we will now move on to our next topic here. What are the external drivers for more innovation? So we talked about the need for innovation, right? And what needs to be in place for innovation to emerge. But what are the external drivers that put more and more pressure on organizations to innovate? Think about it and you know where to put it in our chat. Changes in law, so regulations, uh, competition, customers and competitors, digitalization, so technology in general, right? A ton of reasons that result in more change. Now, we look at this systematically, starting out with globalization, has been a mega trend for many years, is going to be a mega trend for many years. And even if COVID results in some of the globalization going back, that still creates complexity. Why? Because no company in Germany can today build smartphones that companies in China do. We just don't have the capabilities. So if we want to do this ourselves, we need to build up the capabilities, which results in additional complexity. Another one, exponential pace of change. Even if it's not exponential, a lot of people start debating this. The pace of change is always going to be faster than it was in the past, just due to technological advancement. We see this in many, many areas. There's a great video of Gary Hamill, which I will share with you at the end of this session for you to take a look at. He explains it much better than I can, where he talks about what are the drivers for this exponential change. Technology and automation. We have product complexity, more and more customers asking for customized products, right? Which drives the complexity of a product. Increased regulations. One of you mentioned this, changes in law. Knowledge becoming a commodity, not only because you can Google everything, but because you have armies of consultants going from one company to the other. And many organizations just saying, take away, take all of our patents like Tesla is doing. Tesla doesn't believe in their patents being their competitive advantage. Think about that. For many decades, most organizations in the innovation space believed their patents are their competitive advantage. Tesla believes their, their advantage is that they're faster in learning than anybody out there. That actually is similar across all Musk companies, be it SpaceX, be it Tesla, be it um, uh, Neuro, uh, Neuralink, all of them just learn faster than all of their competitors. And finally, hyper competition. Many organizations, I mean, almost every organization used to face competition, but competition now is coming from many different areas. It's not only your existing competitors or people in the similar industry from a different country due to globalization coming into your market. It's also large organizations that are now going across traditional industry boundaries. A few years back, I was working with a Swiss insurance company and their CEO told me, Saurabh, I'm afraid of the day that Amazon will enter the insurance business. A year later, Amazon entered the insurance business. I forwarded him that article. I'm like, your nightmare became true. 
right? Organizations like Amazon, like Apple, like Google, they're not stuck in traditional industry boundaries. We talked about Tesla earlier. They go beyond, they go beyond that. On the other side, we have small startups, hungry people that are willing to go into any area because the barriers in the industries have become lower and lower to entry, right? There is increased regulation at the same time, launching a company has never been cheaper than today. You can build a billion dollar global company out of a dorm room. When was that possible, right? 100 years. Years ago, this was not possible. Today, it is possible. We've seen it happen multiple times and it is happening in many, many industries. So those are external drivers. We also see a lot of internal pressure. And Gallup, not sure to what extent you have been involved in like Gallup research yourself, maybe you've participated in one of their surveys. They do this, I think on an annual basis and always measure what percentage of employees are engaged versus not engaged versus actively disengaged. And the numbers usually look like this. So way more people are not engaged than engaged. And sadly, even more people are actively disengaged than engaged, right? And this is not good. So now think about what is the hidden potential in almost every organization. These are averages of course, right? But what is the hidden potential in almost every organization if they just manage to engage a larger percentage of their employees, they come up with better ideas. They deliver better customer service. They do like, they build better and more high quality products. What kind of differences could that mean? Not only for that organization, but for the human beings working in them, for the customers of those organizations and so on and so forth. So internal and external drivers that basically mean we need to change how we are leading. One great company to mention here, and I cover this very short because I want to get into other topics as well, is Bürzorg, a healthcare company. And they have done tremendously when it comes to employee satisfaction, getting an average rating of 8.7 out of 10. And they do this by giving their teams incredibly amount of autonomy. So at the bottom left, you see a, a, a diagram here about the number of people in different, basically, working areas for Bootsor. As a healthcare company, yes, the vast majority of the people are nurses and other caregivers, around 15,000. That company only has two managers. Think about that. 15,000 plus employees, two managers. Where do you have that? It's the CEO, which is the founder of the company, Jos de Block, and their CFO. When they have 50 back office staff, it's not like team leaders. Those are people building the IT for all of the teams to be able to do their work. And they have 36 coaches. And those 36 coaches, even if they would want to, they cannot micromanage. Why? Because those 15,000 healthcare professionals work in teams not bigger than 12 people, which means they have more than 1,200 teams. Even if you were a micromanaging coach, there's no way you could deal with 1,200 teams divided by 36, right? That's not what you could do. So in terms of employee satisfaction, incredible company, but also in terms of many other areas. So the Dutch government asked Ernst & Young several years ago to compare the outcomes, both from a patient perspective and a financial perspective between Bürtzorg and their main competitors or their peers, right? And they realized client satisfaction's up, staff utilization up, weekly hours per client down, hospital admissions, one of the most critical ones down, staff turnover much lower, administrative or central overhead much, much lower. So with regards to every dimension, costs, revenues, employee satisfaction, patient outcomes, in every area doing much better than the traditional healthcare provider in the same country, right? So let's look at the history of management now. Man and the reason we do this is to create awareness that many things that we consider being part of management were created under completely different circumstances than we have today. And we'll go through that quickly together. Uh, first, uh, quickly about our, our, our axis. On the one axis, we have the time axis and we'll take the time 
from early 20th century, 1906, 1907, where management basically was codified. Before that, not really existed, right? And on the other axis, on the Y axis, we look at the pace of change. And if you remember earlier, I had a slide up with the pace of change being exponential. So we draw that line, exponential pace of change. And we look at the history of management based on the example of the automotive industry. So at the beginning of the 20th century, 1906, 1907, which company was the leading automotive company in the world? Any ideas? Yeah, Ford, already up there. First response wins the prize. Ford was the leading automotive company. Why? Not because they had invented the car that was actually Carl Benz in Germany, but because they had invented the assembly line. So in Ford, they could build cars much quicker and at lower costs than any other organization. And the reason they were able to do so was because they also reduced their product complexity to its bare essentials. The car that Ford built on the assembly line from 1908 till 1927, they built 10 million of that car was the Ford Model T. To this date, when you work at the company like Bain and Company, that's the, the, the poster child for lower complexity, right? Because everything at that car was tried to make as less complex as possible. And there's a great quote from Henry Ford saying, the customer can have any color they want as long as it's black. And the same applied to many of the other areas. Now, if you have low complexity with regards to your product, you can identify so-called best practices for every step of the way. And you have white color workers identifying those best practices and then telling other people what to exactly do and how to exactly do it. And then they can measure them. That's what we refer to as scientific management based on its inventor, Frederick Rinslow Taylor. Some people also call this Taylorism or command and control management, management 1.0. Now, it's important to also understand what the fundamental assumptions back then were. There's another great quote from Henry Ford, and I hope you listen well to this one. It's a pity that when you need a pair of hands, they come with a brain attached. That's a real quote from back then. Now, think about that. That might have been true for Ford. They needed the pair of hands. They needed people doing the same thing over and over again and not think about it, right? But today, do you need the pair of hands of the people working with you or for you? Or do you actually need their brains? My guess is you need the latter, right? So the assumptions under which management initially was created with everything that was part of it are fundamentally different. I'm not saying wrong but they're fundamentally different to what we have today. And we don't even have to jump to today, we can jump in between to the 1960s, staying in the automotive industry, but going to Japan, where Toyota after World War II wanted to become a powerhouse in terms of building cars, not only for themselves, but also exporting the cars to other countries. And they had the chance to send a few engineers to go to GM and Ford and take a look at how they're building cars because those companies were so much more successful than, to sorry, than Toyota was. So those engineers go off to the US, they come back and they are being asked, can we do the same best practices? Can we follow the best practices of GM and Ford? What is their answer? No, we can't. Why? Because we have a completely different context. Why? Just to give you one example, most of you, I guess, are familiar with just-in-time management. And even if you're not, probably you've heard of it. So where does that come from? Where does that originate from? Both Ford and GM didn't have just-in-time. Why? They didn't need it. They had a lot of cash on their hands. They bought a lot of parts. They put those parts in large warehouses. And whenever they needed a part, they just went to the warehouse, they grabbed that part, they built a car. Toyota as a start, didn't have that cash. So if you don't have the cash, you can't buy the parts, you can't put them in a warehouse, you can't do any of the best practice from Ford and GM. So what they did back then, they said, forget best practices, 
best practices, if at all, are contextual. So the moment you change the context, you need to have other best practices. And maybe even then you don't have best practices, you always have better practices. So forget about best, there is no best, there is only better. This was the foundation for the lean philosophy to emerge, which is all about continuous improvement. Mainly continuous improvement in terms of how we do things, not necessarily what we do, right? How we do things. And in order to become better and better and better over time, Toyota also realized, and that's why we have that drawing, it's not enough that you ask your white collar workers, the ones with university degrees to come up with ideas, you need to listen to your front frontline workers. And the way they did this was to enable them, empower them to pull the cord, stop the assembly line whenever they saw a problem, everyone would gather around that, they would fix the problem right there and they would reduce costs for problem solving, increase quality in terms of production and in how they built the product, make that better. So giving people now the ability to say stop actually results in them not only bringing their pair of hands to work, but also bringing their brains to work, right? This was Toyota. Due to higher complexity, they had to start decentralizing decision-making. 60 years later, we look at Tesla, same principle, higher complexity. We talked about Tesla extensively. And what do they do? They decentralize even more decisions. Now it's not only about how we build the product, right? How is our gigafactory structured, et cetera, but also what kind of products we build. Because these teams, agile teams, cross-functional teams, they are close to the customer. They understand the customer's needs much better. They don't have to go to management to ask for permission. They just experiment along their understanding and as they're taking decisions themselves, they can take decisions much quicker and evaluate them much quicker, right? That's all what agility in this case is about. So we see a pattern here, and that pattern is decentralization of decision-making. So there is no best, there's only better, quick reminder from Akio Toyoda. Now, this is the first piece, the context of agile leadership, right? Innovation, becomes more and more relevant due to external and internal drivers. The way to innovate, the way to deal with higher complexity is to have more and more decentralized decision-making. Now, how does that look like for a specific leader? And I want to start again with a question for you. And that question is, what might be holding leaders back from delegating or decentralizing more decisions? What might be holding you back if you are in a leadership position? Take a few moments, put it into our chat. So lack of trust, we hear that several times, fear, accountability, losing power, right? Personal interests, uh, lack of trust comes up several times. I'm not going to answer this question right away. So we're going to keep this at the back of our heads and we dive into an exercise that I want to run with you. This exercise is about the leadership agility model created by Bill Joyner and Stephen Josephs over the past two decades. In this model, they distinguished between three types of leaders, an expert leader, an achiever leader, and a catalyst leader. Well, for each of those, to give you a better understanding what that leadership type looks like, I have prepared a short interview. The first one is going to be an interview with an expert leader. The second one is going to be with an achiever leader and the third one with a catalyst leader. I let you read that interview in silence, right? After every interview, I want you to put the way you perceive or the way you characterize that leader, put it into words, put it into our chat. Then we will quickly debrief as a group and then we move to the next type of leader. Once we've gone through all three, I will then debrief with you the overall model and give you a better understanding what Bill Joyner has created there and how that model works so that you get, leave that basically with a better understanding, all right? So the first one, expert leadership. It's just this one slide. Take a few moments, read through it, and put your personal characterization of that expert leader 
into the chat. I'll be quiet now. So we're getting the first things in, very hands-on, yeah. <laughs> no reflection. Doesn't take the people with him on the journey. Interesting, huh? Became a him. Only about me, only command, centralized. Yeah. Has a need of control, micromanaging. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Constanze, I mean, this happens all the time when I do this exercise. After the, everyone leads about the expert leader, Everyone goes into he. Now, I try to be as gender neutral as possible. Still, it happens every single time. Now, let's look at the expert leader. The expert leader, and some of you have pointed this out, a lot about themselves, right? There's a lot of I, which makes us wonder to what extent this person has a huge ego, right? Then this expert leader is definitely smart, right? There's a lot of experience. There's a lot of know-how. It's not like they're stupid they know what they're doing in that specific area. Uh, it's a lot of di clear direction, micromanagement, I think one of you put in there, do it or does it themselves. In terms of meetings, mostly one-on-one, mo -on -one, right? and you, I usually refer to this as one directional one-on-one. -on -one. So it's not even like a one-on-one -on -one where you actually have a conversation. It's mostly the leader telling the other person what to do, right? That's why we have that thick arrow. Yeah, Sumaya is saying dictator to some extent. In most cases, these leaders are extremely busy, right? As they want to take most of the decisions themselves and do most of the things themselves, they tend to be very, very busy, very little free space on their calendar, very little trust into people, don't listen that well, want to clone themselves, which again relates to probably the ego piece. Uh, problem, people are problems, mostly a shut door, not an open door policy, very tactical focused, very much focused on the individual tasks. And yes, they're very energetic, they're very passionate, and they are probably really, really good problem solvers. Right? That's the expert leader. We will talk later about why this leader type is called expert leader. But for now, we go into the next one, which is the achiever leader. Again, read through the interview, this time specifically point out the areas where you see differences to the expert leader in addition to how you would characterize that leader per se. Go ahead.
So to those who just joined right now, we're re lead, reading an interview with a specific leadership type. Feel free to read that and characterize that leader by typing into the chat. Yeah, so tries to take people more with them. Still quite dominant. Tries to use a network. Negative. Hmm. Maybe you can elaborate on this a bit more, Sumaya. Evaluating and consulting others more than the expert leader. Hmm. Absolutely. Think about the customers that they that they visit. Aware of the surrounding industry. Great point so far. Focus on pointing the issues, sometimes uns unsureness. That's interesting, Jacob. If you can put a bit more on that about that in the chat would be would be nice. So looking at our achiever leader, and remember you will all receive these slides so you can re-go through that by yourself. Compared to the expert leader, I mean, there's still a lot of I in there, but it's mostly about my way, right? The leader knows where they want to go, so they basically lay out that direction. Everyone that goes with them this direction, good. Anyone who doesn't, not so good. So it's mostly about my way or the highway as the Americans used to say. Now that leader tries to get others to buy in. And this is the part where some like Constanza you mentioned tries to take people more with him, but still quite dominant, right? It's not really about co-creating because I already have something that I want to sell. So I want the others to buy in into whatever I want to sell. That's what they do with um, when they bring everyone together, share their idea, let others like contribute a bit, but it's mostly about their idea. They try to influence, so you could even go and say manipulate a bit if you were very extreme. You, people are either on the bus or off the bus with regards to the direction of their leader, meeting type, Compared to the one-on-ones that we saw earlier, this is primarily one too manys Now, imagine one of those meetings. If you go into that meeting room, probably you will immediately know who the leader is, right? Although it's not one-on-ones, but it's still like a very dominant personality in those meetings. Very competitive, very much moving up, structured and top-down, right? People are resources compared to the expert that wanted to do everything by themselves ideally cloning themselves. The achiever is more about, okay, I know I can't do it just by myself. I need other people. So I need to put them in strategic positions. People are considered resources, set stretch goals, very much focused on results, not so much on tasks and more strategic than tactical focused, right? That's the achiever leader. And similar to the expert, we will explore a bit later why we refer to them as achiever leaders. Now, when you think about both expert and achiever leaders, before we jump to the third type of leader, the catalyst leader, I want to highlight one, one uh, similarity between these two. Both of these leadership types are referred to as so-called heroic leaders. What do we mean by that? Any idea why we call them heroic leaders? And I will stop sharing the screen here. Why do we call them heroic leaders? I want to put something in the chat because it's all about them. They want a, a medal, yeah, part of it. Now think about if you take these two leaders based on the interviews that you read out of that organization, what happens? And some of you mentioned earlier, you have seen so many leaders like this. What happens the moment you take these leaders out of the organization? Yeah, 
in many cases, the house of cards breaks down. Why? Because no one knows what to do, right? And it's not because people are stupid. It's because people are not trained to take decisions by themselves. They don't have the habits to take those decisions. Everything always went to the leader. Everyone is looking at the leader for direction. And many of those heroic leaders are in what we refer to a heroic leadership trap. Now, how can you imagine that heroic leadership trap? What I usually use is, is, is the metaphor of a box, right? Imagine you have multiple responsibilities and each of those responsibilities is a box, the size of a shoe box. Now, if those boxes are on the floor, right? And we just look at one of your responsibilities and you are occupying that box with both of your feet, can someone else get into that shoe box? As long as you're standing in that shoe box? Probably not, right? They can't. So as long as you're standing in that shoe box, nobody else can get into that shoe box. As long as nobody else is getting into that shoe box, you believe as the heroic leader, nobody else wants to take responsibility. So I have to stand in that shoe box. And again, as long as you're standing in there, nobody else is going to get in there. There are very few people that I've met across my career that go to the leader, pick them out of the shoe box, tell them, you go there because I want to take responsibility here. Very few people, right? So the only person who can actually, the only person who can actually break that vicious cycle is who? Is the leader by stepping out of the shoebox, even if nobody else has stepped into it yet. So you have to first make room for other people to take responsibility. Now, do you do this with the most important of tasks? Hopefully not, right? You probably start slow with some of the things that are maybe not so crucial so that people learn taking responsibility and that there is mutual trust that you as a leader also know people are going to take responsibility for that before you step out of more important, more crucial topic, topics and responsibilities, right? So heroic leadership is something that we characterize both the expert and the achiever leader with, right? Now, going back to our presentation, we will now look at our catalyst leader. And again, take a few moments, read through this, and then characterize the catalyst leader, focusing especially on the differences between them, the achiever, and the expert. So creative solutions, mm -hmm. visionary, transformational, the coach or a coaching mindset. 
distributing leadership, not, not just being out there by themselves, on eye level, or as we would say in German, on Augenhöhe, yeah? Okay, a bunch of good points. Let's go through this. So the catalyst leader, very first one to talk about we and talk about culture. None of the others talks about culture per se, right? That's one of the biggest differences here. Another thing that we see with the catalyst leader, strong collaborators, many-to-many um, -many meetings. What do we mean by this? If you remember the expert leader earlier, uh, the achiever leader earlier, they also did like meetings with multiple people, but I brought up the, the point, like if, that, if you go into one of their meetings, you would probably immediately realize who that leader is because it's one person in there having the customer perspective as the leader was the only person who talked to customers, at least based on the interview, right? And always say, okay, I've heard this, I've heard this, I've heard this, I, I believe we should do this, do this, do this. Whereas here, having created an environment where more and more people have talked to customers, the catalyst leader can actually create a space where you have co-creation. And co-creation happens on Augenhöhe, on eye level. And it happens when you have this kind of many-to-many -many meetings. So when an outsider gets into the meeting room, they probably don't know who the leader is, right? That's that type of meeting. Purpose and vision driven, right? This could sound, be a bit chaotic from time to time. They are open to say, I might be wrong. And through this, they really get other people's perspectives in. And they really demonstrate that other people can influence the decision-making, even if the leader takes the decisions, right? They create an environment of learning and experimentation they uh, trade transparency and possibility, and they create an environment of safety because without safety, probably people are not going to experiment really, right? They act as a coach from time to time or they have this coaching mindset as one of you brought it up. There are specific differences between a coach and a leader, right? I don't agree that every leader should be a coach or a coach is a leader. There are differences but having coaching capabilities and a coaching mindset, not the worst thing to have. Then people are assets, not resources, and they have a growth mindset in this case, or a growth focus, right? So focus on vision, focus on growth, focus on employee development. Now, looking at the overall model, the leadership agility model, I like to draw it as this type of funnel due to several reasons. Number one, it shows us that people can move from one type of leader to the next one. So compared to personality assessments like an MBTI, where you are considered an ENFP or whatever, and you are that type, in the leadership agility model, this is a maturity model. Yeah, you can be an expert and then you can move into achiever, you can move into catalyst. The other reason I like to demonstrate this as a funnel is that there are certain things that you need to increase over time in order to build those capabilities of an achiever and a catalyst, right? So time is one of the dimensions in this funnel. What are the other dimensions? What else needs to happen? What else needs to increase over time so that a person who is initially maybe an expert leader becomes an achiever leader, becomes a catalyst leader? Communication, mm -hmm. networking, willingness to listen, okay, engaging, all of them good points, transparency, calmness, open, open to change. Yeah, so one of the things that really needs to happen here, in addition to everything you've probably mentioned, is they need to increase in self-awareness and situational awareness, right? If you don't know that you need to change the way you're leading, you're probably not going to change. So I promised you earlier, we will talk about why is the expert leader called an expert? Why is the achiever called an achiever? Why is the catalyst called an a catalyst? This is the right point in time to talk about this. Now, if you think about the expert leader, um, who be when people become leaders the first time, based on what are they promoted into the leadership position? Based on their expertise, right? The best person on a development team becomes the lead developer. 
the best person in terms of marketing on a marketing team usually, right? Becomes the lead in marketing. The best salesperson becomes the sales lead, right? Based on their expertise, people get promoted into leadership positions. Now, once they're promoted into leadership position and because they were promoted based on their expertise, what do they believe? They believe I have to lead with my expertise because that's the reason I was put into the leadership position in the first place. So their assumption is my expertise made me the leader. I am going to lead with my expertise. Now, some of those leaders build up the awareness over time that what got me here won't take me there. There's actually a great book from Marshall Goldsmith, maybe the best coach in the world. And it's called, What Got You Here Won't Take You There. And some leaders build up that awareness, that capability. Now, when they're achievers, they identify themselves with the achievements they and their team have. So they also lead by those achievements. They lead by objectives so that other people have a bit more freedom, but they still clearly lay out the direction. At some point, they understand if they have the awareness that I'm not going to succeed if I always believe that I have to define what the achievement should be. So I need to integrate other people into the definition of what our goal actually should be, right? That's when, if they have the self-awareness, they can move into the catalyst leadership. Now, I mentioned they can, not they will move, because you can have all the self-awareness that you want. If you lack practice, you're not going to get there. And one of my favorite analogies here comes from sports. And I, I really love tennis. I like watching Roger Federer play, one of my favorite tennis players of all time. And if you look at a person like Roger Federer, does he only have one way of serving the ball? No, he has maybe 20 ways he can serve the ball. And how does he decide when to serve which way? It's all based on the situations that they're in. Is it the first serve? Is it my second serve? Am I serving to win that specific game or am I, am I serving against a break? Am I serving to win the match or am I serving against someone else to not win the match? And how has my opponent returned my other serves? All of those things are relevant in terms of taking the decision what, time of, what type of serve to do next. That's the awareness piece. His ability to execute that serve is not based on the awareness, is based on the practice, the 10,000 times of practice that he had done in order to be able, in a moment of pressure, deliver that serve in more in higher chances than, 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 than like failing that serve. So awareness is one piece and practice is the other piece. Now there's one big distinction between us as leaders and athletes. And that distinction is very important. Athletes do get to spend the vast majority of their time in practice, right? 90%, 95% in the case of Usain Bolt, who only runs for 10 seconds, maybe 99% of their time, they are practicing. So they have, by definition, a safe to fail environment to practice whatever they want to learn, right? Now, we as managers spend 90, 95, 99% of our time in the game. That's our daily jobs. And if we are lucky, we get to spend 1%, maybe 5% of our time in practice, be it an agile leadership course, be it this info session, be it a coaching or mentoring relationship, right? Other than that, we are in the game. So if we want to practice, probably that one to 5% of our time is not gonna cut it. Especially if we want to make huge differences or huge changes to how we currently lead our teams. This means we need to create safe to fail environments in our daily jobs, in the game, in order to be able to practice, uh, to gain more experience and become better leaders. That's one of the messages that I want you to take away 
from this leadership agility model. The other piece, equally important, but before I answer a question, do you believe that it's the goal of a leader to be purely catalyst? Very quick no, and I agree, right? We talk about self-awareness and situational awareness, depending on the different contexts in your organization you probably need to flex your leadership style from one way, from one type to the other. But you can only do this if you're capable of all three. So if you are by default an expert leader and you don't even have the awareness that there are other ways to lead people and organizations, there's no chance that in a situation where it would be appropriate to act as a catalyst that you can act as a catalyst. But if you have built that capability, that skill set, you can decide in every given situation am I going to be a catalyst? Am I going to be an achiever? Am I going to be an expert? And in order to give you an example that you can again take away with yourself, go back 15 years or, in, or think about me 15 years younger, still all black hair, no, no, no single gray or white hair on my head. Like at the end of medical school, being in an emergency room, like working there, gaining some practice. And of course, there is an attending physician in that same emergency room with the responsibility to make sure we save more patients than we lose. Ideally, we save every single patient. Now, the very first patient comes in and they maybe have like cut their finger or anything, right? Uh, probably that attending physician goes like, ah, oh, Sorab, you can do this. Go take care of it. Now, the next patient that comes in has all the symptoms of a heart attack, right? Ch pain in their left chest, going into their arm, shortness of breath, everything that you would associate with a heart attack. Now, what would you want the attending physician to do? Would you want them to act as a catalyst and say, Sora, you young medical doctor, you go work with that patient. And by the way, whenever you need help, you can call me and then I try to guide you through that as your coach. Probably not, right? Probably you would want them to roll up their sleeves, similar to the expert that we learned about earlier, and save that specific patient's life. Now, how would you distinguish between an expert acting as an expert and a catalyst acting as an expert. Sorry. What would be the difference? How would you notice those differences? And if you have an idea, feel free to unmute yourself and share. I guess in this case, they've chosen from a set of choices. It's not a default. Yeah. yeah. So they would make that choice, right? But how would someone from the outside understand that or see the difference between them, Rachel? Huh. Would they? Would they? Yeah. So I would make an argument that would. Why? Because the catalyst that decides to act as an expert does also something else. Given the self-awareness and the situational awareness, they ask themselves, why do I have to now act as an expert? And the reason is probably this young doctor, Sorab, he has no idea what to do. So in order for that to not happen again, that person needs to learn. And one way is I don't tell them to take over the patient, but I drag them along with me. I say, you come with me, watch and learn. And while I'm saving as a catalyst that patient's life as acting as an expert, I teach someone else. If time is too critical and I can't do that, probably right after I say, hopefully, save that patient's life, call a timeout, tell everyone, come, and then explain to people why I rolled up my sleeve, why I had to save the patient's life, why this is not sustainable for our patients, for our hospitals, and for every single doctor in here, and what we're going to do about this so that this does not necessarily happen in the future. 
And then we come up with a development plan for every other doctor and maybe other caregivers in that specific unit so they can deal with that type of situation in the future themselves. Doesn't happen overnight, but at least we come up with a plan to deal with this. That would be one big difference between a catalyst acting as an expert and an expert acting as an expert. Yeah? Among maybe other differences as well. So here a bit more detail about the nuances if you look at the different types of leadership. And maybe one important thing just to highlight again, right? An expert is primarily an expert and doesn't have the awareness nor the capabilities to act in any other way. An achiever has the ability to act as an achiever, but also act as an expert and the catalyst can do all three. So depending on the situation, they're able to flex their leadership style, their leadership type. Now, when, why am I introducing this one here? When we talk about agile, right? And agile leadership is the ability to flex between the different leadership styles. When we talk about agile with regards to teams, a lot of organizations say, oh, we want to do agile. From tomorrow on, our teams are self-organized or self-managed, right? The problem is none of them thinks about what needs to be in place. None of them would be very radical. Many of them forget to think about, let me put it a bit more like politically correct in here. Many of them forget to think about what needs to be in place so that those teams can actually be self-managed. Are they able to execute the team tasks? Are they able to monitor and manage their work? If yes, then okay, self-management could be a good next step. But if they are not, we need to teach them. And teaching, it's not enough to say from tomorrow on you're self-managed. It's actually helping them build up those capabilities. And this is something that I see a lot of organizations forget. That's why I put it in here. Really define for yourself, what would you want your teams to be responsible for? And then come up with a plan to teach them those specific things. Now, um, we talked about decisions earlier and the hesitancy of a lot of leaders to delegate decisions to their teams. And you all mentioned that it could be a lack of trust, it could be fear, it could be many other things that results in leaders being not that willing to delegate or decentralize that decision-making to their teams. Now, when we think about that, that might be true because some of their teams don't have the capability. So if a leader, similar to Jean Roumin, whose slogan is let everyone become their own CEO, if a leader wants to have more and more decision-making on team level, they actually need to create the capability of decision-making. Part of that is problem solving. Part of that is domain expertise. Part of that is also the courage to take those decisions because they can distinguish between reversible and not so reversible decision makings. At Amazon, they call this type one and type two decisions. Part of that is to analyze whom do I have to involve in a decision and how do I get stakeholder involvement? And part of that is giving them the power to take those decisions. So it's not only about empowerment, it's maybe even more about enablement. And this is the task that we as leaders have to take on, make people better at taking decisions. Now, what are the things we need to do to become a more effective leader? How do we become a more effective leader? Switching back to our presentation here. How do we become a more effective leader? If you have ideas, you can either put it in the chat or, or also unmute yourself and, and speak. Make yourself obsolete. Okay, this is a tough one, <laughs> which basically means fire yourself at some point in time. Um, help people to reflect, having a we attitude to carry everybody along, never stop learning. I like those things. So when we think about leadership, right, being that set of practices, 
a lot of people refer to this as mindsets, like we talked about the expert leader mindset, achiever leader mindset, catalyst leader mindset. And mindset is ultimately how we act in situations. So very much driven by the habits that we have. And if we think about changing habits, one important way to change them is the following. Number one, you need to create awareness that your current habits are probably not serving you, your team, and your organization well. That's number one. Number two, you need to consciously, over and over again, make choices in specific situations to not go down your default way, which is your existing habit, but go down a different path to over time build new habits through new rewiring of your neurons in your head. And once you do that over and over and over again, you will experience that change. Now, what can we do here with regards to leadership very specifically? Because that's what I, my intention is, that you leave this two hours with a clear idea on if you want to make a change, how that could look like in the case of expert achiever and catalyst, one way to think about them is in three categories. Do, being the expert, lead, being the achiever, and coach, being the catalyst, right? Mostly acting as a sparring partner, but if needed, being able to also take decisions for them. So what I recommend people to do is to look at this sheet here. Sorry for skipping some slides, but this is the one that I actually wanted to share with you listing some of your most important projects and responsibilities that you have, listing in the next column, what are the, your current habits? Is it primarily do, lead, or coach? My guess is there will be a lot of do, maybe a bit of lead. And what is your desired habit? But that's not all. You also need to think about what are triggers or cues that I can use that help me remember that I want to make a change. Because if I don't have those triggers, if I don't have those cues, chances are I will follow my existing habit, right? So make sure you create those cues or, or triggers in your environment. If you want to learn or dig deeper into habit change, there are several great books. Two of them are listed in the appendix of this presentation. One is called Atomic Habits from James Clear. The other one is The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Both of them are amazing. Now, let me give you a clear or concrete example. When I heard about this specific topic many years back, what I decided as my concrete next step to become a more effective leader was to think about every single responsibility that I have and consciously make a choice. Do I do it? Do I lead it? Or do I coach someone else doing it? right? Now, how do you remember to make that conscious choice? I looked at my existing habits. And one of the habits that I had with regards to tasks was the following. In most cases, my tasks came in as email, probably the same for many of you, like a customer asking for something, a colleague asking for something, whatever, right? Emails used to be a lot of my tasks. Now, I used to have a habit, which was categorizing the emails that come into three buckets. What needs to be done today? What needs to be done this week? And what can be done later? So based on urgency, right? I had a habit, email comes in, root, categorize that email into the three buckets. Now I did a simple tweak. I replaced those three buckets by do, lead and coach. Now, every time an email came in, my habit still kicked into play, right? And But now I had to look like, oh, there is no today, this week, or later. It's actually about, do I need to do it? Can I lead someone else? Or can I coach someone else doing it? I also had a sticky note at my desk, which said, why you? So every time I put, wanted to put something in to do, I had to ask myself, why me? Why can't I lead someone else? And there might be good reasons for that. One reason could be my customer just expects to get a response from me. That's okay. Or I am very passionate about this and I like to do this. That's also okay. 
the message is not give everything away so that you don't do anything yourself, right? The message is systematically think about how can you give more and more stuff to the people that you're working with so that you do not become obsolete but can cover more important stuff going, fo going forward. So now I was classifying all of those things and it really helped me to delegate more and more stuff towards my team, identify the reasons why I had been hesitant, bridge those gaps, educate them, re share with them more and more of my context so they, they could take those things in a much, much better way. And once a leader does all of these stuff, sorry, next one, I get that. Uh, they can spend time on many other things. So that's why I er er earlier said, I don't agree with leaders becoming obsolete because probably you have a bunch of items on your backlog that you today cannot get to do or, or work on because you're too deep in the operational, in the day-to-day -day stuff. And once you take yourself out of that day-to-day of -day stuff, then you probably can work on some of those more, more important stuff, more of the st strategic stuff, some of the more visionary stuff that you are also interested in working on, all right? So that's a brief introduction into the topic of agile leadership, using the leadership agility model, providing you with a bit of the context here. A final word, I promise you, this is not going to be a sales pitch. I want to give you the opportunity or basically some guidance on what you can do next. A, at the end, in the appendix, a bunch of references with regards to books and videos that you can watch. So here you see six books, Here's a list, an even longer list of books. Feel free to do that, right? Then if you're interested in learning about this topic with me or another educator, we offer certified classes. The, these classes are instructor-led classes certified by the Scrum Alliance. Um, most of those trainings are, are run by me, but we also have very capable other partners, other trainers working with us. Or we have a self-paced online course for agile leaders which will, be, which will be launched soon. We're already working on the videos. So most of them are already like, we recorded them. We're now in post-production. They will be up soon. You can already sign up for them. I will share with you a link if you're interested to do that. That's all I wanted to share about a potential path towards agile leadership. In addition, we also have a bunch of other info sessions similar to this one that are free. For example, a week from now, that one will be in German though. We have a session about agile hardware development. This week, Thursday, we have a session about mindfulness in two hours. So if you're interested about learning more of these concepts, not necessarily part of leadership, but still to expand your understanding of the topic of agility, I will share those links with you as well in the follow-up email that I, that I will send out today, including the recording of this session so that you can sign up for them and, and learn. 